there are there are more seats on the sides over here, so just just kind of move move in that direction. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna get started. I'll stand up just for a minute. Okay. Okay, we're going to get started. Please take your seat. How wonderful to have Noam Chomsky back here with us. This, this will be our, our third interview between the two of us, uh, one of them a long time ago in 1974, <clears throat> focused mostly on anarchism and, and other uh, current ills in society that, uh, that were then uh, uh, wide ranging. Now we're <clears throat> visiting again with another wave of turbulence and, and, uh, and uh, problematic issues. But, um, there's a lot to be gained from um, discussing these. There's a lot to begin to find hopeful ways forward, paths through uh, the thicket, and so forth. And that's what we'll be mostly uh, discussing today. For the three or four people out there who don't know Noam Chomsky, I'm going to <clears throat> give an introduction. Um, <clears throat> in terms, quote, in terms of the power, range, novelty, and influence of his thought, Noam Chomsky is argu arguably the most important intellectual alive today. I'm delighted that uh, he could be here to join us in Boston for a special session entitled A Conversation with Noam Chomsky. This session will be a conver conversational interview followed by an opportunity for our audience participation through a, a Q&A period. As most geographers know, Chomsky has written and lectured widely on linguistics, philosophy, intellectual history, contemporary issues, international affairs, and U.S. foreign policy. A small sampling of his numerous publications include uh, the book that I was first introduced uh, to him by, American Power and the New Mandarins, um, then a lot of linguistics works, including Cartesian linguistics, uh, and num a number of political books, well over 100 books, I think, um, for reasons of state, the political economy of human rights, on power and ideology, language and the problems of knowledge, profit over people, new horizons in the study of language and mind, understanding power, and most recently, the requiem for the American dream. Noam's work on the nature of human language and communication has profoundly transformed the field of linguistics and greatly influenced science and philosophy more, bra more broadly. The so-called Chomskyan revolution generated intellectual reverberations across many disciplines, including geography, anthropology, education, psychology, and genetics. Noam Chomsky is one of the most frequently cited scholars of all time. Noam also has been an impassioned critic of American foreign policy and of corporate and government power. His now classic book on the role of intellectuals in American society, American Power and the New Mandarins, greatly influenced the debate on the Vietnam War and continues to prompt exa examination of the complicity of intellectuals in implementing po policies entrenched, uh, in, in, in entrenched power to this day. His arguments resonate strongly in the context of the rise of new authoritarian regimes at this time. It's a wonderful honor and great pleasure to welcome Noam Chomsky. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to start out, <clears throat> start out on one topic other than Trump. And because uh, <laughs> if we get on that topic, we may never get off it for the rest of the, the, the interview. So I, I've, I'd first like to, um, <clears throat> to learn from you, uh, Noam, <clears throat> a little bit about what you think about the, the role of human rights uh, today. Uh, do you see human rights as a being able to play a role as sort of a foundational framework for us as we move forward, uh, some form of grounding, or uh, have the abuse of those areas been, been too, too wide-reaching? 
Uh, I, I pose this question uh, in the context of a, one of the major themes of this particular meeting of geographers. We have more than 9,000 geographers assembled here from around the world. Um, and that theme is, um, <clears throat> is mainstreaming human rights in, in geography and the AAG, our association. Uh, this has grown out of about 10 years of work that we've been doing with a number of groups uh, from Amnesty International and many human rights organizations to uh, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. One of the outgrowths of that has been a very interesting coalition that's come together uh, called the Coalition for Science and Human Rights. Uh, and this has brought together over 40 scientific associations from you know, chemistry to uh, the social sciences. And uh, we've, we at the AG have, have played a central role in the development of, of that coalition over the years. So um, what, I guess what do you see as uh, potentially promising strategies for advancing human rights and, and, and should we be doing that or should we focus on something else? Well, there is, of course, uh, a gold standard <clears throat> on human rights. The uh, Universal Declaration, 1948, uh, theoretically states adhere to it and practice. That's far from true. Uh, the uh, Universal Declaration, as I'm sure you know, has three components of equal significance. Uh, one is uh, civil and political rights, the first one. Uh, the second is social and economic rights. Uh, the third is uh, community and cultural rights. Uh, the stand of the United States is pretty explicit. Uh, in principle, the United States supports the first component. We can ask about practice, but at least in principle, it's advocated. There are quite interesting questions about practice, about, say, the history of uh, what's called democracy promotion and so on. Could go into that if you're interested. But at least in principle, it's advocated. Uh, the third component, uh, cultural uh, community rights, is simply ignored. There's al almost no discussion or comment on it. Uh, the second, social and economic rights, is, is an interesting one and very much uh, on the agenda constantly, especially Article 25, which calls for, which de declares that uh, the right to uh, health, uh, health, health care, decent jobs, uh, reasonable employment, so on and so forth, are all fundamental human rights. Uh, the US has a position on that. It was stated pretty blandly by uh, Reagan, Ronald Reagan's uh, Secretary of State, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick. Uh, she described this component of the declaration as uh, a letter to Santa Claus uh, that was uh, uh, reiterated and uh, expanded by uh, uh, her followers, uh, Paula Dobriansky, Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, uh, Mars Abram, uh, the uh, US uh, ambassador to the UN Human Rights Commission, uh, in his case, commenting on uh, the, uh, uh, the, the right to development, which pretty much paraphrased Article 25. Uh, the US alone refused to sign it. Uh, Abram called it a, uh, a provocation, uh, a dangerous provocation, uh, an idea that has no basis in law or practice. Uh, Dobriansky dismissed, uh, dismissed it as, dismissed the myth that social and economic rights are fundamental human rights. And we see it in practice. They were not alone, incidentally. Uh, the Russian ambassador, uh, Vyshinsky, right at the outset, uh, dismissed this as sort of a pious joke. So we're in good company. Uh, in practice, uh, you can look at the uh, records of the uh, OECD, you know, the organization of the rich countries, roughly 30 rich countries. Uh, they have uh, detailed annual reports on the, uh, what they call social justice, the extent to which members of the rich club uh, provide, uh, so observe 
the conditions on social justice enunciated in the Universal Declaration. Uh, the U.S. Uh, ranks way at the bottom alongside of uh, Mexico and Turkey, uh, about 29th, I think, or so of the 30-some countries. And uh, we see that uh, in many ways. We're seeing it right now in debates in Washington. We see it in the fact that uh, the United States is uh, practically alone in the developed world in that it does not have uh, some form of national health care except for the general public. But that's not because people don't want it. In fact, there was a poll just a couple of days ago which showed once again that given three options, uh, what's called single payer here, meaning universal health care, uh, the Republican proposal, the Affordable Care Act, uh, the, the Republican proposal was opposed by a huge majority. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was had moderate support, but majority support was for public option, uh, universal health care. Uh, that's been true for many years. It's one of the a very, it's a, it's a very interesting fact about U.S. public opinion. Uh, the, when the question is asked in a reasonable way, you know, a lot, as, as you know, polls depend a lot on how the questions are formulated, but if the, poll, if the questions are asked in a sort of a rational way, then quite typically people prefer uh, universal health care, uh, sometimes with uh, great enthusiasm. So toward the end of the Reagan years, for example, uh, about 70% uh, of the population thought that there should be a constitutional guarantee of health care, should be in the Constitution. And about 40% of the population thought it was already in the Constitution. Uh, nobody <laughs> knows what's in the Constitution except that it's a holy book with everything good, and so it must have universal health care. And there have been results for, like that for a long time. It, when it's, it's not discussed very much in the press, but when it is, the commentary is interesting. Uh, so, for example, uh, when, when Kerry was running for president, uh, the last debate was on uh, social and economic policy. If you look back at the Times commentary, it says uh, that Kerry didn't bring up uh, any notion like uh, public health care, national health care. And the reason they said is, interesting words, they said it has too little political support, which is correct. It is not supported by those who determine policy. Uh, the financial institutions, the pharmaceutical institutions, uh, they don't support it, so it doesn't have political support. Uh, there is something called a population, uh, but their views are not political support. And this, of course, bears on the first component of the Universal Declaration, civil, civil and uh, uh, political rights, and about that there's quite a lot to say, but I don't want to drone on about it. <laughs> we're, we're, already, we're already trending into Trumpism, but we'll, we'll re, let's back up just a little bit here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as I mentioned, one of the major themes of, uh, of, our, of our meeting today is, is um, is, is human rights, but not, not only the uh, current provision, but, but how they might be applied to sort of day-to-day -day activities of, of, uh, of academics, of people conducting research, people trying to anticipate what the outcomes of their research would be, and, uh, and how, to, how to manage that, that, those kinds of tricky questions in terms of the practice of, of say, geography, the practice of philosophy, the practice of of uh, many, many types of science. And of course, um, with lots of new technologies coming up, it's, it, it's, uh, we run quickly into unintended consequences of technologies. We run quickly into unforeseen uh, com consequences. And of course, there's the wide range of intended consequences, which, or, or those that should have been foreseen. And uh, this is uh, somewhat close to, to my own uh, heart because uh, uh, <clears throat> earlier in my career, I, I developed, a, I did develop and patent the first real-time 
um, interactive GPS and GIS systems, geographic information systems, which, which um, <clears throat> at that time had broad-based uh, environmental applications that they were developed for. And now we see that, that uh, you know, most are used now heavily in surveillance. <clears throat> they're used heavily in uh, areas, uh, essentially in modern warfare. In fact, most of our wars are fought now basically as one big, large-scale, real-time interactive GPS GIS system. And uh, so these, uh, these questions are, are, are bedeviling, and they're also, um, uh, I think, require uh, <clears throat> us to engage them uh, at, at various points. Uh, and uh, yet, yet, once the genie's out of the bottle, what do you do? Well, as I'm sure you're aware, there is a, a group within the American Ge uh, Geographical Society, the uh, Network of Concerned Geographers, which has been uh, coming forward with petitions and proposals about exactly these issues, mm -hmm. uh, specifically about the cooperation of geographers with the military. Uh, GPS is an example. GPS, of course, was developed within the military, then offered to others, used for surveillance, for bombing, for all sorts of things. Uh, geographers, of course, are very closely involved, just like anthropologists, with uh, what are sometimes called human terrain issues. Uh, what does the military expect to do in particular areas? And uh, that raises hard questions, which the group is raising and I think should be taken very seriously. Uh, their petition uh, lists a series of specific proposals. Uh, I presume that uh, you're taking account of them and taking them into consideration. I certainly think you should be. And for other professions, uh, similar questions arise in a quite a similar way for anthropology and the anthropologists have taken some fairly strong positions about uh, participating and uh, not, not participating in military actions, uh, addressing uh, indigenous tribal communities, uh, and uh, uh, others have very much the same concerns. Uh, there are some cases of human rights uh, which we are all critically concerned with. Uh, they should be on the top of the agenda for everyone. Uh, that's the question of human survival, uh, which is at stake now in a way that it has not been for the roughly 200,000 years in which Homo sapiens have been around. As again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but we're now uh, well into two new eras in human history. Uh, the nuclear age began in 1945, uh, the Anthropocene, which the American Geological, the, the World Geological Association now decided to date at roughly the same time after the second, immediately after the Second World War, where a human impact on the environment created essentially a new geological epoch. And these two threats are existential, uh, imminent, and furthermore, we're racing towards magnifying them, which is very, uh, as I've said many times, I find it really hard to find words to capture the fact that with eyes open, knowing what the consequences are, the United States is now separating itself from the world and racing towards the precipice of environmental catastrophe. Uh, the other great issue, nuclear war, uh, tensions are building up at the Russian border. Uh, that's been increasing since uh, 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, NATO began to expand. Uh, senior statesmen like uh, George Kennan and others uh, warned right away that NATO expansion is uh, a disaster in the making for pretty obvious reasons. You can simply ask how the United States would be reacting if uh, the Warsaw Pact were, uh, uh, had taken over Latin America and was now approaching the Mexican border and the Canadian border. Of course, that's 
absolutely inconceivable we would have had a terminal nuclear war long before this state arise, arose, but it's now happening on the Russian border. Serious provocations on both sides. Uh, there is uh, the best single monitor of the prospects for human survival, in my view, is the uh, doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Serious scientists, political analysts gather every year and try to do an analysis of how far we are from midnight. Midnight is terminal. Uh, the doomsday clock was established in 1947. At that point, the hand was seven minutes to midnight. It's moved up and back over the years. Uh, the closest it came to midnight was 1953, when Russia and the United States exploded uh, thermonuclear weapons. Uh, it's then changed. Uh, now, uh, a couple of weeks into the Trump term, uh, the clock has been moved another half minute towards midnight, two and a half minutes to midnight, uh, the closest it's been since 1953. And now, as distinct from then, uh, two major issues are raised by those who set the clock. Uh, the constant and growing threat of nuclear war and the ominous uh, threat of environmental catastrophe, uh, both issues of particular concern to geographers, but of great concern to every human being, anyone who cares about whether uh, organized human life will uh, survive on the planet. Thanks. Um, have some of the issues that we talked about uh, just now related to um, uh, engagement with, with the military and so forth, is, is that an issue that's come up with linguists as well? You know, as you probably aware, a great deal of linguistics or at least language uh, training is funded by the DOD. certainly did. The, uh, back in the early 1940s, when I was an undergraduate, um, a great deal of the linguistic work was being done in the uh, army language schools. This was during the Second World War. People were being uh, taught uh, languages where U.S. forces might be deployed. Uh, not sure exactly how it worked out. I had a few personal experiences. A good friend of mine uh, was sent to a Hungarian language school, and he was deployed in Korea, naturally, which actually <laughs> has a kind of a weak uh, connection with Hungarian way back uh, many thousands of years ago. Yeah. But I suspect a lot of it was pretty much like that. Yeah, we've also yeah. often been saved by <laughs> like uh, large strategic plans going awry. So. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> in later years, um, there are issues which I think are not very well understood. So take uh, where I've been all my academic life, MIT. Uh, in the 1950s, when I got there, uh, the Institute was overwhelmingly supported by the Pentagon. Uh, that was every part of it including the libraries, uh, uh, the music department, uh, everything else. Forget the exact figure, but could have been something like 90%. Uh, I was working in a lab that was 100% supported by the three armed services. Uh, and it also happened to be the lab which was the center of academic anti-war resistance. Uh, that's the lab where we started national tax resistance in 1965, uh, helped organize the uh, uh, resistance support group, Resist, which still exists, uh, which came to trial in the Spock trial a couple of years later. Uh, all of this was going on in a military lab, 100% supported by the three armed services, and there was of no concern to anyone, because what's not recognized very well is that the Pentagon from uh, the 1950s through the 1970s and to an extent today was the uh, U.S. government uh, industrial policy system. If you wanted to develop the high-tech economy of the future, uh, the way it was done was to frighten the population into 
thinking the Russians are coming, and then put money into what became finally uh, computers, uh, internet, uh, lasers, uh, microtechnology, uh, uh, the GPS. Uh, in fact, most of the high-tech economy that we know. Uh, decades later, literally, it was handed over to private enterprise for marketing and profit. And uh, that continues. So for example, if in the 1950s, if you walked around MIT or other major research institutions and took a look at the buildings that were around, uh, they would be uh, uh, electronic firms, you know, Raytheon, uh, iTech, others, kind of feeding off the research that's done under taxpayer subsidy in the uh, research institutions. If you walk around the same institutions today, uh, you'll see uh, Pfizer, uh, Novartis, uh, mm -hmm. other pharmaceutical companies. Uh, what's happened is that the cutting edge of research and development has shifted to an extent from electronics to biology. So now taxpayers are funding unwittingly the uh, high-tech bio biology-based uh, economy of the future, which will be privatized and handed over to private enterprise for marketing and profit. It's more complicated than that, obviously. Nothing is as simple as a couple of sentences. Uh, but this is a large part of the way the American so-called market economy works. Uh, and we're not alone on that by any means. We happen to be more advanced. Also goes way back in history. Could, could, would, would we be safe in saying that without military funding, the theory of transformational grammar might not have <laughs> occurred? Well, if it hadn't been for military funding, you wouldn't have computers, much bigger things than transformational grammar. You wouldn't have computers, <laughs> uh, the internet, uh, satellites, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. much of the basis for the modern high-tech economy yeah. was funneled through the Pentagon. Uh, kind of like the, uh, uh, these days people are talking about big infrastructure projects, you know, like the interstate highway system. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember uh, will recall that the interstate highway system was called the National Defense System. It was built, taxpayers were supposed to fund it because it was essential for our defense. You had to move missiles around and things like that. So the, uh, the National Defense Highway System. Of course, what it really was, was a way to undermine efficient transportation, like rail transportation, electric uh, railways and so on, and shift uh, uh, the energy system to the use of uh, fossil fuels, uh, massive waste of fossil fuels. That's a large part of the Anthropocene that we're suffering from today. The National Defense Highway System was a part of that. There were many other parts, real estate things and so on. In fact. As you may know, there was one literal conspiracy, meaning the courts determined that it was conspiracy and fined the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in Los Angeles, uh, where in the early 1940s, uh, General Motors, uh, Firestone Rubber, and uh, Exxon, what is now, what's now Exxon Mobil, was an earlier version of it, uh, got together and uh, decided to dismantle the very efficient uh, electric railway system in Los Angeles and replace it with uh, highways, uh, automobiles, uh, trucks, and so on. Those of you who know Los Angeles know what the outcome is. Uh, that was a literal conspiracy. Now, they were brought to court. Uh, the court determined that it was an illegal conspiracy and actually sentenced them, they fined them. My recollection is it was about $5,000, uh, enough to pay for the victory dinner, maybe, or something like that. But these are the way, this is the way the economy functions pretty generally. And again, it's not us, it's not just us. It goes back to early history. Many illusions about these things. Yeah. Um, you know, there does seem to be a <clears throat> sort of a cyclical, uh, pattern historically with nationalism and now authoritarian regimes. 
uh, sort of a trend toward uh, more of those. You look at um, Brexit, Poland, Philippines, and so forth, and uh, perhaps here in, in uh, the United States. Um, do you see this um, as a as a as as what as a cyclical uh, event, or do you see this as something that is growing uh, ever closer to uh, the precipice of, of uh, dictatorship and so forth? Well, there is what's called a rise of populism, uh, nationalism, fear, uh, fear of the foreigner. Uh, it's very easy to instigate in the United States. Uh, the U.S. has always been a very frightened society, uh, maybe the safest country in the world, but very frightened. It doesn't take much to scare people. Uh, and uh, if you think that uh, Europe is very much different, you should take a look at the polls there. Uh, recent polls in Europe showed that the majority of the population wants to keep all Muslims out of Europe. All, okay, even worse than here. Uh, and it's, uh, it, uh, and people can easily be frightened. Uh, this morning's New York Times, you might have noticed an article on the front page about a group in Canada, in some town in Canada, which is mobilizing to prevent the imposition of Sharia law there's a slight problem. There aren't any Muslims around, but you can never be too careful. Uh, one of the American states, I think maybe Oklahoma, has actually passed laws to ban Sharia law, which is just imminent, as, as you can tell. Uh, this, this, this morning, I got a, an email from a guy who was coming to interview me. He's, uh, he was born in, Ger in Germany. He lives in England. And British citizenship. He's a member of the uh, Syrian Writers Organization, bitterly anti-Assad, and he's uh, a, a, go back a generation or two. He's Syrian. He was stopped at Heathrow Airport by, by uh, Homeland Security and barred from coming to the United States. Uh, we can't be uh, too careful. Who knows who'll be coming here to kill us? You no. Know? It's kind of the same mentality as uh, carrying a gun into Starbucks. If you have a cup of coffee, you know, they may be coming for us. Now, there are roots of this in American history, and uh, deep roots. And as I say, England is not much different. But the question we should really be asking, obviously, is why is this showing up everywhere right now? And there's some pretty good reasons for that. It has to do with the actual consequences. Maybe you can argue whether they were intended, but they were certainly predictable of the social and economic policies that were instituted in the late 1970s, uh, the so-called neoliberal programs, uh, the Washington Consensus, as they were called. A uh, uh, lot of fakery about it, but uh, large part was uh, uh, let the market handle everything. As I've already indicated, it's very far from that. And if you look closely, uh, there's massive subsidy to the very rich and powerful. But for the rest, uh, let the market take care of them. Uh, you have an extreme version of it. If you take a look at the uh, Freedom Caucus proposals today for health care, uh, why should there be any right to health care? If people don't have enough money to pay, it's their problem. They should have made better investments or found better parents or something like that. It's not the problem of society. Uh, that's the radical uh, counterpart, opposite end of the spectrum to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in fact to what most people believe. But that's a strain in American history and elsewhere, the fear of uh, Polish workers in uh, England, let's say, the workers who are coming to do dirty work that English don't want to do. And you get ideas that they're somehow taking over our pure England. There's a background for all of this. The people who feel this have indeed suffered from the impact of the neoliberal programs. So if you take the United States, the richest, most privileged country, and the one that in many ways was least harmed by these programs, even though they largely originated here. Go back to uh, 2007. 
that's right at the peak of euphoria about the wonderful economy that St. Alan Greenspan is running. Uh, economists were calling it uh, the new moderation. Uh, we've learned how to control the economy. Everything's going to be fine from now on. Uh, this is right before the crash, which ruined everything. Uh, and incidentally, undermined the entire intellectual edifice with no, um, no impact, which is quite an interesting uh, phenomenon in intellectual history, but we'll put that aside. Uh, take a look at 2007 and look at real wages for American workers. These are non-supervisory workers, you know, guys who were working on the assembly line, building things and so on. Their wages were actually lower, real wages were lower than they were in 1979 when these neoliberal programs were initiated. So there's been, and it's a, it's a symbol of what's been happening all over. Uh, there's uh, been stagnation or decline for a large part of the population showing up in all sorts of ways. Uh, we now have this remarkable phenomenon in the United States of uh, middle-aged, uh, uh, mostly white male workers whose mortality is increasing. That never happens in developed societies, but mortality is increasing for this sector of the population. And it's mostly uh, diseases of uh, hopelessness and despair. Now, these are people who don't want to get a handout from the government, have contempt for people who do, and angry at them. They want a dignified life where they uh, uh, can have self-respect in what they're doing, feel they're doing something important. It's all been taken away from them by very specific policy. Similar things are happening in England. It's the background for Brexit. Uh, in Europe, uh, the austerity programs that were imposed by the Troika, you know, the governing authorities, have devastated the economy. Uh, economically, they make no sense at all. Uh, even the International Monetary Fund economists uh, have coming out with papers saying they don't make any sense. But the IMF bureaucrats, who are not the economists, are joint, they're part of the Troika. They're implementing them, along with the uh, European Commission, which is unelected, uh, and the, uh, the bank, which is, of course, unelected. And that goes back to the first part of the Universal Declaration again, along with this attack on fundamental basic human rights, the rights to a dignified life, which our societies could easily provide with their resources. Along with that, there's been a sharp attack on democracy, and people are aware of it. And you can run through the evidence which shows it very clearly. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the reactions is uh, general hatred and contempt for institutions, pretty much across the board. They're not working for us, we hate them, and out of that can come many things. Some of the things that come out of that are very destructive and dangerous, but other things that come out of it are extremely hopeful. We should pay close attention to what happened in the last elections here. Uh, the most startling event in the elections was not the election of Trump. It was the success of Bernie Sanders. That breaks from literally a century or more of U.S. political history. Uh, U.S. political history has been well studied by very good political scientists, uh, Tom Ferguson and others. Uh, a very good predictor of electoral success is just campaign funding and also of uh, uh, policies undertaken. There are other factors which yield, which converge to, uh, uh, to stress that outcome even more way before Citizens United, which kind of opened floodgates. Uh, but it goes back a long time. Uh, the, and uh, Sanders came along, uh, no funding, no corporate funding, no wealthy funding, dismissed, disregarded by the media, a guy who was totally un, almost unknown. He was using scare words like socialist, which means New Deal Democrat. And uh, he practically, he could, if it hadn't been for party shenanigans, party managers, you might very well have won the election. That's not only a radical change from 
American history, uh, but also a very promising and hopeful sign for the future. And it's extended by popular attitudes today. Uh, there was a poll uh, a couple of weeks ago by Fox News, <laughs> of all people, who uh, tried to find who was the most popular political figure in the United States. And one person was way ahead of anyone else, Bernie Sanders. And among young people, even more. Uh, all of that, uh, that's another form of what takes place when social and economic conditions are bringing about stress, despair, uh, anger, uh, fear. You know, one kind of reaction is uh, uh, violence and uh, uh, xenophobia, racism, and so on. Another kind of reaction is futility. Let's just give up. It's too big for us. Third kind of reaction is let's do something about it. And there's every reason to think that that can be done. So there are no reasons for real despair. Very hopeful signs, I think. <clears throat> That's great. You know, you have a habit of, of uh, being so comprehensive in discussing these topics and leading to the next logical topic that you just already addressed <coughs> my next two uh, questions, <laughs> one being on uh, the concentration of wealth and the ownership of the media by a few and its, uh, its role in, in, uh, uh, you know, in, in the role of money more, uh, more broadly in elections. And uh, you've just pointed out one way around that, but it's, it's a very difficult course still when you've got the media controlled by uh, corporations and most of those corporations have the same interests as, as other corporations. And uh, so, so what, what's the prognosis in terms of how, how you practically, what strategy is there to, to roll that back? Well, I think there are two parallel tracks, uh, both of which have been followed. Uh, one is to change the media. And I think that's been done. Uh, there's a lot wrong with the media, the major media. I'm talking about New York Times, you know, CBS, Washington Post. Plenty wrong with them. But I think they're a lot better than they were 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, part of the reason is that the society has just become more civilized. Uh, the uh, impact of the activism of the 1960s and later years has simply been to educate people, to change their attitudes on all sorts of things. Uh, so for example, take, uh, take say, um, the two kind of core basic crimes of American history, two horrible crimes, ex near extermination of the indigenous population and slavery, uh, indescribable crimes. But back in the 1960s, they weren't particularly regarded as crimes. So if you look at the leading anthropologists, the best scholars in the 1960s, what they were saying about uh, indigenous uh, population in the United States, the, not just the United States, the whole continent, was uh, maybe a million people, uh, hunter-gatherers, uh, straggling around, uh, uh, they didn't possess the land, so it didn't mean anything to take away from them. Uh, that's, not, that's no longer true, either of scholarship or even what kids read in, read in school. It's, it's a long way to go, but the history has been very significantly uh, the false history has been very significantly overcome. It's now possible for not just scholars, but uh, uh, high school students to learn a good deal of what really happened. Uh, and uh, there is a reaction. So for example, the state of Arkansas, a couple of months ago, uh, uh, the legislator, legislature initiated a legislation, I don't know what happened to it, to ban Howard Zinn's books from the schools. You didn't have to do that 30 years ago because they couldn't have possibly entered into the schools. That's a sign of progress, significant progress. Pretty much the same is true of slavery. The real nature of American slavery is just being exposed in recent years by serious scholarship. I mean, it's not that a lot of things weren't known. You know, they were but they were kind of hidden in arcane places. Now it's becoming 
public knowledge on the basis of very serious work which is bringing out entirely new information. These are big changes. Well, that affects the media too. The people in the media grew out of this culture. They're more civilized than they were in the 1960s and 50s. And uh, the other path is just creation of alternative media, uh, which is far easier now than it was then, far easier, and can be done very effectively. Uh, things like, say, uh, Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! are a real uh, means for many people to get a view of the world that they wouldn't have gotten before, and many other things like that. Uh, Glenn Greenwald's uh, Intercept, many others that you all know about. So there's plenty of things that can be done. It's just a matter of grasping the nettle, doing the things that you have opportunities for. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting how uh, with, these, with these populist changes and, and, uh, and the way in which the um, uh, candidates have, have continued to stoke really uh, historical roots of racism and anti-Semitism and the substantial rise in, in, in both of those areas, in Europe as well as here in the United States. Uh, that's a really frightening thing. Uh, well, let's take anti-Semitism. I mean, I'm in my late 80s, so I can remember the 1930s, and it was pretty scary. Not just what was happening in Europe, which was terrifying, but what was in ordinary life here. So my, my father, was a, my parents were teachers, Hebrew teachers. And so they had a, they kind of survived the depression. You know, they didn't starve. In fact, the whole family was coming around and being helped by the few people who had jobs. Around 1937, I guess, uh, my father uh, made, had enough money to buy a secondhand car. Uh, we lived in Philadelphia. And uh, my parents decided to take us in, on the weekend out to the nearby mountains, just to Poconos, just to spend a weekend, uh, uh, weekend's vacation. Uh, so we had to get to a motel. Uh, there were the motels you had to look at carefully, uh, uh, because uh, there were word, there were signs on them that said restricted. Restricted meant no Jews. You didn't have to say no blacks. That question didn't arise. You know. But no Jews. 19, that's the late 1930s. Uh, I, I could tell you personal anecdotes of what it was like to grow up on the streets as a young Jewish boy in an Irish Catholic neighborhood. Not very nice. Uh, but uh, when I, I got to Harvard in the early 1950s, uh, the anti Semitism was overwhelming. There was practically no Jewish faculty. In fact, one of the reasons why. MIT became a major university, is that uh, outstanding people like, say, Norbert Wiener and others couldn't possibly get jobs at Harvard. Well, that was anti-Semitism in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. There are problems now, but it's nothing like that. Absolutely nothing like that. It's much better than it was. So it's not something to laugh at uh, by any means. Uh, those who have experienced it and lived through the periods of the hideous atrocities in Europe are certainly not going to disparage it, but we have to recognize that it's become radically different. Uh, by now, Jews are one of the most privileged, uh, maybe the most privileged minority in the country. And pretty much the same is true of so-called European anti-Semitism. So I think we should certainly not disregard it, but uh, recognize how far we've come and not only how far we've come, but why the progress was made. That's what's critical, because those are the things that we can continue to carry forward instead of succumbing to futility and despair. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> building on that, that uh, discussion, um, I'd like to talk about um, what, what is a, a sort of another rising um, uh, area of, of, of of resistance, at least perceived resistance in, in some ways, and, and that's the uh, rise in, in boycotts, various uh, boycotts of various different areas. And um, you were quoted in uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education um, recently, uh, noting that uh, 
that uh, you had um, come out against the BDS, uh, the uh, boycott, divestiture, and sanctions, uh, arguing that um, failed initiatives, which is how you uh, characterize much of the BDS movement, harm the victims doubly by, uh, quote, shifting attention away from their plight into other issues such as uh, anti-Semitism and academic freedom, and by wasting current opportunities to do something meaningful. You want to elaborate on that or give us your thoughts on how you arrived at that position? Well, in mentioning boycotts, uh, we shouldn't overlook the fact that, again, as you all know, there is a boycott movement right here of uh, distinguished geographers who have called for a boycott of the American Geographical Association um, in protest against the uh, kind of uh, uh, regulations and uh, procedures that the Trump administration is instituting. In the case of this Syrian, actually British writer of Syrian origin, who I mentioned before, is an indication of what's happening. That's an issue to certainly be thought about. How should professional societies uh, react to this kind of thing? So, for example, should professional society meetings take place in the United States? It's a serious question. Should they take place in a country where uh, uh, people from designated countries, designated by the authorities, are not allowed to come freely? Uh, the Latin American Studies Association uh, years ago began to have conferences elsewhere because of the uh, restrictions against Cuban scholars. I think those are all things to be thought about. Now, the BDS movement is a different matter. Uh, first of all, we have to make a distinction between the tactics, BDS tactics, and the BDS movement. They happen to be quite different things. So BDS tactics in the Israel-Palestine case were actually initiated in uh, 1997 by an Israeli group, uh, Gush Shalom, Uri Avneri's group, uh, strongly anti-occupation, militantly anti-occupation, a very significant, played a very significant role, still do. Uh, they proposed boycotts uh, of the settlements and divestment from anything involving the settlements. And that's been, I mean, I myself have been involved in the, it's really BD activities. There are no real sanctions. There's, that's a state matter. But these, uh, I've been involved in these things since the late 90s when it took off, aimed at the settlements. Now here questions arise. The BDS movement, which developed in 2005, uh, has a different approach. That's the movement, not the tactics. Their approach calls for, if you read the list of principles, there is a set of principles, if you take it literally, uh, they're calling for boycott of Israel, divestment from Israel, sanctions on Israel, until then comes a long list of conditions, uh, some of which everyone knows are totally unrealizable. Like one of the conditions that's listed in this almost catechism, is return of the refugees in accord with international law. Well, first of all, it's not in accord with international law. That's a separate question. But return of the refugees. Uh, you can think whatever you like about the morality of that, but everyone knows it is not going to happen. There's no international support for it. If there ever were serious support, Israel would go all out using nuclear weapons, anything else, to prevent it. So it's not going to happen. And dangling this hope uh, uh, in front of uh, people living in miserable refugee camps in Lebanon and Jordan is not a good idea or a moral position, in my view. Uh, if you take a look at the, in all, BDS is not a principle, it's a tactic just as it was in the case of South Africa. It's a tactic. Uh, tactics have to be designed so that they're going to have uh, favorable effects for the victims. Uh, tactics aren't designed so that the person who undertakes them can feel good. Uh, that's not a way to design tactics, at least if, you're, if you have ethical uh, imperatives. 
you ask yourself, what's the impact on the victims? And if you take a look, there's a record of significant success, very significant success of BD, really BD tactics uh, aimed at the settlement. Uh, say the Presbyterian Church, for example, big organization, uh, has taken a very strong stand on divestment and boycott of anything, having anything to do with the settlements. And crucially, they aim also at US institutions, US multinationals that are involved in the occupied territories. That's very significant, both for educational reasons and tactical reasons. And that's been a big success. And there are other successes like that. And I think those are very good, sensible tactics. The European Union has taken some steps in that direction. Uh, the human rights groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have advocated similar things. Uh, all of that makes a lot of sense, I think, in principle. And it's tactically effective. And it should go way beyond. So take, uh, if there's ever going to be any significant progress in Palestinian rights, it's going to require a major change in the United States. As long as the United States continues, as it has been doing for decades, to provide uh, economic, uh, diplomatic, uh, military, even ideological support for the settlement projects, uh, they're not going to end. They may uh, take, use different words, but they're not going to end. They're going to continue. And the US does not have to do that. American citizens can prevent that. In fact, one critical tactic that I think ought to be pursued, I've been advocating this for years, is simply imposing American law. American law, so-called lay amendment, bans any military aid to any military a unit or a group that is involved in systematic human rights violations. Well, I don't have to go through the record, but anyone who's looked at the, the wars in Gaza or what goes on in the West Bank has no doubt, in Lebanon as well, has no doubt that the uh, Israeli army has been engaged in systematic human rights violations. So therefore, by American law, we ought to cancel uh, military aid to them. Uh, even a move in that direction could have significant implications, very significant. It's a little bit like the Sanders story or the press. There are plenty of things we can do. If you think them through, ask what the consequences are, what the possibilities and opportunities are, and then pursue them seriously. Not because something makes you feel good, but because it's beneficial to the victims. That's the question that should be uppermost all the time. Um, I'd like to ask a question now about, uh, you know, we have uh, many, many of our members are, are come from the come from China these days, and uh, we're really glad to have them uh, as part of our organization. Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, get your your thoughts on on the rise of China, which has has been remarkable from an economic perspective, um, and the you know, it's extensive investments it now has around the world. And, and do you imagine a time in the near future when, when the dominant economy and the dominant uh, sort of international um, uh, network, let's call it, um, would, uh, will it see <coughs> sort of transcend that of uh, the US and, and, uh, and Europe? Well, if you go back a couple of centuries, uh, 17th century, uh, China and India were the most advanced uh, commercial and industrial centers in the world. Uh, England had to steal technology from India for its own industrial development, uh, textiles, shipbuilding, and others. I mean, it was so extreme that even when, during the Napoleonic Wars, when England was really in, sometimes in dire straits, uh, Parliament banned import of superior Indian ships so as to protect the, uh, but the new uh, the British uh, shipbuilding industry. Well, of course, that all changed through colonialism. 
And now China is beginning to recover something like its traditional role, you know, the uh, Middle Kingdom, to which others pay tributary. Uh, it's uh, in many ways a pretty ugly process and threatening. In many ways, it's uh, had its uh, positive consequences. Uh, will China, I mean, it's, there are now books coming out. In fact, there have been for decades. Uh, recent one, Gideon Rachman and others, uh, talking about the Asian century, you know, that uh, the center of power is going to shift. First it shifted from Europe to the United States. Now it's going to shift over the Pacific. I don't think there's much reason to believe that. Uh, China has quite a, lot, a very big economy by purchasing power, parity roughly like the United States, but it's a very poor country. Uh, take a look at the uh, UN, the Human Development Index. Uh, China, I think, is around 90th. Uh, India is maybe 130th. And they've been pretty well stuck there. Uh, they have plenty of huge problems that we don't face. Uh, also, ecological problems. Uh, this, they don't have much in the way of uh, rich agricultural uh, resources the way we do, and that's being de destroyed. Uh, China is taking sensible, significant steps towards, de towards addressing the uh, environmental catastrophe. It's kind of astonishing that today the world is looking to China to, for s salvation as the United States is going backwards. That's an astounding fact. And China is doing it, but they have plenty of problems. Uh, I think it'll be a long time before uh, they become anything like uh, the Western powers in uh, wealth and privilege. Now, United States power has been declining. There's, you've all heard the phrase, America's decline. Uh, common, you know, common lament. Uh, you can get uh, foreign affairs, I mean, uh, International Affairs Journal uh, had a front page cover a couple of years ago called Is America Over or something like that. Uh, this is all fear mongering. Uh, American power has declined from its peak, which was after the Second World War. You have to go back and think what it was like. Uh, Second World War was very beneficial to the U.S. economy. Uh, the U.S. wasn't much touched by the war. Other industrial economies were devastated or destroyed. Uh, U.S. manufacturing uh, practically quadrupled, pulled us out of the depression. A uh, big back, uh, there was a big backlog of uh, technology, other possibilities for the great growth rate of the following years. Uh, the U.S. had uh, no the statistics weren't very good in those days, but it's some estimate that the U.S. may have had almost half of world wealth. Probably not that high, but something like that. Well, of course, that declined. That was never going to last. And it declined very quickly. In fact, the first step in the decline was China. In 1949, uh, an event took place, which is called in modern US history, the loss of China, which is a very revealing phrase. And I notice that nowadays it's sometimes put in quotes because it's so ludicrous. Uh, but for many decades, it was called the loss of China, meaning we own China and we lost it. That's the assumption. China became independent. And then a major theme in modern American history was who lost China. You know, that's uh, what drove so-called McCarthyism. It went on way into the 60s. Uh, John F. Kennedy, when he was escalating the war in Vietnam was saying that he didn't want to be accused of being the person who lost Indochina as if it's ours to lose. Uh, that declined, that was a serious blow to US power. Uh, so the, but the US still remained by far the most powerful country in the world. If you took it, look at US, by the 1970s, the international economy was becoming what's often called tripolar, three major centers. Uh, North America, based in the United States, uh, Europe, based mainly in Germany, and East Asia, which at that time was based mainly in Japan. Now it's Japan, the Asian Tigers, and a rising China. And that was, uh, Northeast Asia was already the most dynamic industrial area. But a lot of it is derivative. 
derivative. So if you take, China is a huge assembly plant. If you take, say, your iPad, uh, own, you know, it's the company in char who in, in, in designs it is Apple, biggest corporation in the world. Uh, they farm out uh, production to Foxconn and other subsidiaries, Taiwanese, big ta Taiwanese companies. Uh, they hire cheap labor in China where it's assembled. If you take a look at the profit that comes back from the iPhones, uh, China gets very little. Uh, Foxconn gets more. Uh, Apple gets most of it. That's why they're the richest corporation in the world. Then they make sure they don't pay taxes by setting up their offices in Ireland and so on. That's, uh, I mean, that's, so China is developing undoubtedly, and it's a significant fact. Uh, most of the decline in global poverty over the last generation has been China, which is not insignificant, but they have plenty of problems. And there's another issue which is barely discussed and is crucially important. It's been brought up uh, particularly by a young political economist named Sean Stars. He's done very interesting work in which he investigates who owns the world's economy. He points out that we have moved from a period where national economies were the major entities in world global economy. Um, they never were totally, of course, and we haven't totally moved away from it. But there's been a drift towards an international economy where multinational corporations play an independent role. They're based in states. They rely on states. Uh, taxpayers have to support them and so on. So they are based in national states, but they have global reach. They set up these complicated supply chains. Uh, that's how you get the I iPhone story, for example. So he asked a simple question. How much of the global economy is owned by US corporations? Turns out to be about 50%. That's pr probably higher than the share of the global economy that was owned by the United States at the peak of its power. In virtually every sector, manufacturing, uh, retail, finance, uh, uh, US corporations are either first or second. The Chinese corporations are way behind. You know? And that's a different measure, which isn't being used very much, but you should keep in mind when you think about uh, what the economy, how the global system's developing. There's another dimension, military, and that's critical. And in that, the United States is way ahead of anyone else. I mean, US military spending is almost as high as most of the rest of the world combined. And uh, now, one of Trump's programs is to build up what he calls our debilitated military, uh, which already overwhelms any conceivable combination of powers. And technologically, it's way more advanced in all, every possible way, you know, space, everything else, uh, cyber war, pick, pick it. And of course, the US is the only country that has uh, hundreds of uh, military bases all over the world. Other countries may have one or two or something. We have maybe 800, if you count the lily pads, many more. And military operations going on all over the world constantly. Now that dimension, the US is absolutely supreme. It's not something we should be proud of. Uh, and it's not something healthy for the society, uh, but it's a fact. So I, I don't see, to get back to the question, much chance of an Asian century in the sense in which people are lamenting. Not that it might not be a bad idea, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, um, you know, one of the things that, that's remarkable to me um, over the series of inter interviews we've done over the years, going way back, uh, is the con your consistency. I mean, you, I keep trying to trip you up on a question that I'd asked earlier and see if you'd change much, and then not so much, you know. And, uh, That's not a good characteristic yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's called stubbornness. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, when I first, the very first interview we did, it, it was for an anarchist uh, magazine called Black, Black Rose. And um, one of the first questions uh, I asked you was, um, and I'm going to read it, and uh, and I think you still, to, to this day, you, you um, uh, identify as a libertarian socialist? 
as a, as a tag, as a, as a kind of an identity and so forth? And to the extent that you have to identify yourself. If you have to pick a name, that's okay. That's okay. Actually, so, I should say that a, no, I'm read you something a from friend of mine who's a philosopher had to uh, contribute an essay to a collection of philosophical essays commenting on work of mine. And he opened his essay by saying that he had a problem because the only ism I seem to believe in is truism, <laughs> which is not too wrong. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, um, in any case, uh, this, this article, uh, first question was about our anarchism and, and its role, its potential relevance, if, if any, to our current world. And, and uh, you answered that with some uh, interesting ideas about how it, it might be relevant to uh, an advanced uh, technological society. And mm -hmm. I'll just read the, uh, the question quickly and, and your <clears throat> summarize your answer, uh, 1974. Uh, in your essay on notes on anarchism, you were pretty sympathetic to uh, anarchism. And then we talked about how there are some roots in, in geography with uh, Kropotkin, Reclus, and so forth being uh, anarchists and, and geographers. Um, you talk about reintegrating anarchism into the 20th century. Um, do you see anarchism as being relevant to social problems in the advanced capitalist countries? Your answer was, as you know, anarchism, anarchism covers a broad spectrum. Um, that particular, particular strain of, this was Daniel Guerin at the time, uh, isolated and studied, I think is a valuable, valuable one. It's one that converges pretty much with libertarian Marxism, I think. Marxism also covers a pretty broad spectrum and there's a point at which some varieties of anarchism and some varieties of Marxism come together. Um, this is a topic that we might raise with David Harvey in his talk tomorrow. You're welcome to come. <laughs> okay. and, uh, um, so they, they both, they come together. Uh, <clears throat> and out of that complex of ideas, anarcho-syndicalist syndicalist ideas and libertarian socialist ideas, it seems to me that the, there is a very applicable, uh, in fact, I think those are exactly the appropriate ideas for an advanced technological society. It seems to me that anarchism in that sense suggests certain principles of organization that are extremely realistic, sort of a natural evolution with a high enough level of technology and communication and elimination of onerous but necessary labor. Under those conditions, it seems to me entirely possible and in fact essential to move toward these social forms so very much appropriate to an advanced industrial society. Do you you hold those views still? Yeah, I still think, in fact, I think there's uh, interesting steps in that direction. Yeah, yeah, so for example, take uh, this huge problem of uh, deindustrializing America and just take a look at some of the things that have happened. So for example, in uh, 1977, uh, I think it was, uh, US Steel decided to close down their plants in Youngstown, Ohio major steel city built by working class unions and labor in the steel and other manufacturing industries. Uh, the union uh, offered to buy the plant and to hand it over to the workforce. Uh, the company didn't like that, probably for class reasons. There's case after case where uh, multinational major corporations, which are often run by financiers, you know, banks and so on, uh, don't prefer not to make profit if it will undermine class struggle. So the idea that workers could take over and run a plant successfully is not an idea that they want to foster. And for that, they're willing to take a cut in profits, or so it looked it and seemed studied carefully. Anyway, it went to court. Uh, the corporation won. Uh, Stoughton Lind, who was the uh, lawyer for the uh, advocate for the union, con continues to live there and fight for it. Mm -hmm. But they didn't give up after that. They turned to something else, establishing small worker-owned enterprises in the old Rust Belt, the northern Ohio area around Cleveland, uh, integrated into the kind of economy that's developing there, kind of a service economy. And some of this is working very well. 
uh, Goral Perovitz has written very effectively about it, both the theory and the practice. And these are things that certainly can be done, and they could be done on a very large scale. So take a couple of years ago in the midst of the crash. Uh, as you recall, uh, uh, the government, Obama, basically nationalized the auto industry, pr pretty much took it over. Uh, there were some choices at that point. And the choice that was taken was determined by the uh, ideological structure and the power structure internal to the country, which could have been different. If people like us were acting, it could have been different. There were two choices, basically. One choice, the one that was taken, was to bail out the companies, uh, hand them back to the same banks and managerial elite who ran them before from different faces, but essentially the same institutions, and have them proceed to uh, produce cars. Okay, That's what was done. There was a much more sensible ta uh, uh, option, both in human, uh, uh, political, and even uh, environmental terms. Hand the uh, auto industry over to its workforce and the community, have them run it, and have them produce what the country needs, which is not more cars to make traffic jams, uh, but uh, decent, uh, uh, decent mass transportation which would make a much better life and a much healthier life and uh, a much uh, significant contribution to uh, reducing the threats that we face. Well, that was never considered. But if it wasn't considered, it's the fault of people like us. We're the kind of people who should be acting to make it be considered. And these things happen all the time on a small scale, on major scale. And uh, this is all moves towards uh, developing what uh, Bakunin, great anarchist thinker, one, once called building the facts of the future within the present society. Uh, cooperatives, worker-owned enterprises, uh, uh, other, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, developments like that are, can begin to build a better future within this society. The same is true of the, uh, pr the problem of, uh, the massive problem of climate destruction. Um, the federal government right now happens to be a wrecking ball. Uh, they want to destroy everything as fast as possible, okay, in the interest of short-term profit. That's transparent. Uh, but that doesn't mean it has to stop. Uh, states can do things, localities can do things, uh, small groups can do things, individuals can, and they can make a huge difference, a very big difference. In fact, maybe enough of a difference to uh, prevent the wrecking ball from destroying all of us. But it has to be done. I mean, even simple things like uh, Go ahead. All right. there are a lot of institutions, and I and I'd like to say even our institution, um, which is works in the interstices of between corporations and large governments and so forth, and are in some ways a you know a, a very oppositional force to what is occurring now. Um, and so, and I think I, I think that if you look at the uh, the DIY do-it-yourself economies and, that are de developing in Baltimore and Brooklyn and and in Detroit, I grew up in I was born in Flint, Michigan, and grew up saw the demise of everything. And uh, um, you know, I was uh, I was just there again recently, and it's remarkable how uh, strong the, the city is finally starting to come back. Really, it, it really, and I, you know, I've heard. And I'm, I'm skeptic because I've heard it's all, something going to happen for 30 That's years now, and, and now it really is. In fact, I think we should hold a meeting in Detroit at one point in time. And um, if we do, um, if we do, and, you know, and, and of course our members never complain about anything, but occasionally I get word that oh, the, the hotels are too expensive. So. My, my, my approach is we hold a meeting in Detroit. And well, it, hotel it, it, prices it, are going down because people are refusing to come to the United States. Oh, not yet. So <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll discuss this <laughs> offline. Um, <coughs> but, uh, you know, I thought, well, one way we could save money, we, we could just buy everybody a house for $100, and they would have that for the, the meeting. And, 
I'm done. But uh, now, unfortunately, unfortunately for us, the and unfortunately for the city, there's been a massive movement into downtown Detroit from people from all of the other DIY, you know, Brooklyn, Baltimore, um, Berlin, uh, moving into the city, as well as people from the surrounding areas. And the, the, the vacancy rate is about 1%. And, uh, and you, all kinds of small industries are there. It's really quite impressive now. But on that note, then, um, I want to, I wanna, no, I got a bone to pick with you. Pardon? I've got a bone to pick with you. Okay. <laughs> I wanna, you know, it's been bothering me for a long time. And that is that for my whole life, wherever I go, People come up, come up to me, they walk up to me, I'm in a cafe, I'm you know, minding my own business, not bothering anybody. And they say, are you, are you Noam, Noam Chomsky? <laughs> I get it all the time, are you Noam Chomsky? No. I say, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not. But it, it keeps coming, are you Noam Chomsky? And I said, well, I said, well. It's gonna get, well, get worse. First I said, you know, <laughs> well, and at first, and I, and first at first, I said, no, I'm his son. You know, that didn't work out. And then, and then I tried other approaches. And, and, uh, and finally, um, you know, I sort of reconciled, began to reconcile myself to it when about, you know, maybe 15 years ago, you know, your hair turned white. And my hair was still brown. And I want you to know my hair is still brown. I dyed, I dyed, I dyed, I dyed it white so I look like you again. But what happened is people started coming to me and they would say, you know, are you Woody Allen? <laughs> I mean, you know, you got, you know, are you Woody Allen? You know, I get the, word. I said, no, no, I'm not Woody Allen. I'm Noam Chomsky. <laughs> well, my wife, Valeria, who's over there, who knows Woody Allen and has in fact worked with him. And she has an idea in mind to try to convince him to have a film in which he plays me, or maybe I play him, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I actually was, my next sentence was gonna be a request that, you know, I could perhaps, you know, I work a lot of hours at the AG, nobody knows that, you know, around the clock, weekends and everything else. And, and so I, I was thinking maybe I could go away for a couple week, couple months, you know? You could come in my place. And, and people might not even know that I'm gone, you know? <laughs> but anyway. But I also want to ask you um, another personal question, if you don't mind, before we, uh, we wrap up. Um, you know, you're, you know, I, you know you've, you've, you've worked so hard for so many years. You've made so much, done so many wonderful things and, and, and been in the forefront of necessary battles. And um, I just wonder if you've ever just thought about, you know, maybe going to the south of France for a while, retire, and maybe, maybe go to some kind of South Sea Island. Uh, maybe take up the arts or a musical instrument or, you know, who knows what. Maybe we'll pursue a whole new career path. And, um, and, and the reason I, I ask that, you know, there are some rumors coming around that, that you are considering other possible, um, other possible <laughs> forms of, of, of uh, of employment, and there was a very respectable, owned by the Washington Post publication that in print itself, right on the print page, carried a story about your possible um, next, next, next gig <laughs> in uh, Las Vegas. And was, now I want to know, there's a lot of fake news, we hear about fake news all the time, and I you just to show want to show the picture. It's so, yeah. Oh, isn't it up there? Oscar? Okay. So, um, you know, there is a, a lot of fake news, and I just wanted to confirm whether this was a, a rumor or whether you're seriously taking on a whole new kind of profile. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for being such a good sport. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see this before? Oh, it's an onion. It's a whole story. <laughs> you got to read this. You got to read the story. Too. Yeah. <laughs> the Onion is a um, kind of a spoof type thing. It's actually, it is actually owned by the Washington Post. And uh, so um, we're now at a point where 
I want to <clears throat> take a few minutes um, to uh, make an award to you, and then we'll have some questions, okay? But we're going to get the award in first. Um, the, um, the AG has a, <clears throat> as its most prestigious award, is the AG Atlas Award, which was launched in uh, 2010. And it's designed to recognize and celebrate outstanding internationally recognized leaders who advance world understanding in exceptional ways. Not American exceptional, but, <laughs> but in exceptional ways. The image of Atlas bearing the weight of the world on his shoulders is a powerful metaphor for this award program, as our nominees are those who've taken the weight of the world on their shoulders and moved it forward, whether in science, politics, scholarship, or the arts. Uh, earlier recipients of the award included primatologist Jane Goodall, international human rights and political leader Mary Robinson, and civil rights icon Julian Bond. So you're in good company. Noam Chomsky has been selected as this year's recipient of the AG Atlas Award. As you know, he's one of the world's leading public intellectuals. He has written and lectured widely on linguistics, philosophy, science, and everything. <laughs> Chomsky's wide-ranging intellect and impassioned work has long inspired geographers and his highly regarded comp contributions on contemporary topics concerning globalization and the intersections between geography, economics, and politics <clears throat> are of great interest to AG members. For these reasons and many, many more, we're proud and pleased to recognize Professor Noam Chomsky with the 2017 AAG Atlas Award. Thank you very much. I'll bring it up. Okay. So, okay. Can you take this? One other two, this comes off. There's a world on his shoulders. And uh, so, so we got to put this up here. First, we put the world on his shoulders. Get a picture of this. <laughs> and uh, this, is, uh, this is the. I, this is the uh, this is the most androgynous atlas that I was able to find. So <laughs> there you go. So and also with that, um, we also have a of course a, <clears throat> a nice a nice thing to you know put under that pile of books that you've been waiting to get rid of, and then uh, so. Thank you all very much. And then we have a read on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Help people out We'll need it. We'll have them pack it up for you. <laughs> we'll put this up we'll, up here while you're taking questions. They they need to know that this is Atlas. So so now we'd like to take a few questions. And this is a check on. Oh, thank you. Um, Okay, do we have the people at the microphones, the microphones set up and ready to go? Okay. Where should people go? Okay, it's hard for me to see with these lights here. So since I can't see, uh, have people line up and we'll, we'll start uh, on, uh, on, on either, either aisle. Okay, let's start over here, please. Hi, no, um, Danny Bednar. Department of Geography, Western University. Uh, I can't decide if I want to ask you about the ge geopolitics of outer space, which is my subfield, and I don't know if it's something you've thought about too much. You did mention uh, space technologies in your discussion of U.S. Army supremacy. Um, I want to ask if you, you have thought about the expansion of, of neoliberalism and hegemony uh, into that next step and using that space, not in the literal sense, um, as a means of control and dominance. Um, and also what you think in this kind of uh, new promotion of Martian colonialization. I know it's sometimes something that gets a laugh, but uh, within it are interesting narratives of colonialism um, and extension of the existing modes of power. Uh, and I wanted to ask you if, if you've ever thought of those types of things and what your thoughts are. Well, if you take a look at the uh 
the military planning, the quadrennial reviews, uh, they regard uh, control of space as a critical element in running the world. Uh, they want, uh, you know, the ways of uh, directing uh, weapons that can hit a narrowly identified target within minutes from controls in outer space, uh, massive surveillance, uh, all sorts of other uh, 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 ideas. And, and no doubt that's all being developed. In fact, you can read about it in the, even in the public documents. As far as uh, inhabiting other planets are concerned, I personally, I, I would regard it as a sort of basically a joke except for the fact that there are some uh, pretty respectable people who uh, take it seriously. So Stephen Hawking, for example, is one of the great contemporary scientists, has argued, I presume seriously, that since humans are heading for extinction by their own uh, deci decisions, uh, the only way the species can survive is by finding some other planet. Personally, I can't take that seriously, but Hawking's a serious person. Uh, the, um, there is uh, an effort to kind of privatize space travel, but it's, uh, you know, kind of games for multi-billionaires. Uh, okay, we'll take a question over here now. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, in 1967, you published uh, The Responsibility of Intellectuals. And a lot of us are grappling with issues of how to be more engaged scholars, especially during this time with such alarming circumstances. Uh, and that's out there for people to read in print. But I wonder if you have any updates to that you'd like to add for the 21st century, and if you could just comment in general about the responsibility of intellectuals. Well, actually, the. Boston Review of Books, which is the Boston counterpart to the New York Review of Books, uh, a couple of years ago uh, uh, asked me to write an update, which they in fact published. Uh, and uh, it is the first chapter in a recent book called Who Rules the World? So it kind of looks at the problems from a fairly recent point of view. I think this must have been 2007. Uh, if I were to write it today, again, uh, you can find different circumstances all the time. But I think the basic issues remain about the same. Uh, the people who are called intellectuals may not uh, are called that because they have a certain degree of privilege. Like uh, maybe the janitor who cleans the floor of, your, of somebody's office understands the world affairs and human affairs much better than the uh, Nobel Prize scientist who sits behind the desk, but he's not called an intellectual. So intellectuals are people who have a sufficient degree of privilege and justified or not authority so that they have opportunities to articulate uh, views, opinions, uh, reach people with uh, commentary and discussion of the world scene and also become involved directly in uh, activism in ways which can help inspire others. Those are the consequences of privilege. The privilege confers responsibility it's straightforwardly. It means you can do more things than people without privilege can. And I think that's the essential message. Then comes the question, how this responsibility is used? How is the privilege used? Well, if you look through history, it's not very pretty. Uh, overwhelmingly, all the way back to uh, the earliest historical records, uh, critical, open-minded intellectuals have suffered in one way or another. How depends on the nature of the society. Okay. But they have also made many achievements. I'd like to ask the, the first woman in this line to step forward. Uh, we got a, a whole bunch of men got up there first. So. My name is Julia. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. And I wonder if we may say that we are going through an epoch of extremes right now. Um, extreme uncertainty, extreme lack of ideologies and 
collective cosmologies and worldviews, extreme movement, but extreme closure at the same time, uh, extreme individualism, extreme poverty, uh, but also extreme concentration of richness and therefore extreme inequality. Um, extreme territorial and natural, natural exploitation, extreme threats to human life, as you mentioned, uh, in a plethora of ways. So, which would your advice be, or even your warning be, to the new generation of researchers and academics that are here today um, to listen to you? How can we work better, and how can we be better in view of the clock getting closer to midnight. Um, does, for instance, these extreme epochs require, in your opinion, more radical positions? And how, what would it mean to be radical in this sense, if this is any meaningful? Thank you. Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard. I mean, uh, I, I'm often asked for advice, often by young people, and I really don't know what to say. I mean, the kind of people who, like us, say, have every opportunity available to us. We can do, we, we enjoy a legacy of privilege and freedom that was handed down to us by struggles of people under much harsher conditions. I mean, some of the things that are happening today are indeed extreme. It's the first time in human history that we're facing uh, real process, prog uh, prospect of extinction. Now, that's new. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the 1930s were in many ways a much more terrifying period. Uh, repression in the United States in the past has been far worse than it is today. Uh, people talk about repression, the right to do it, uh, but there's nothing like Wilson's Red Scare or uh, the COINTEL Pro uh, operations that went through the Johnson, the Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon administration. Uh, the, uh, and the uh, rise of fascism in Europe was really a terrifying matter, even before the Holocaust, and we saw that. So there's all kind of horrible things that have been the case in the past. We have plenty of problems now, we have lots of opportunities, and we have to try to achieve what we can. So for example, take say climate change. I think a pretty good argument can be made that, uh, that, that uh, the fundamental principles of capitalist society are, and market societies are simply inconsistent with human survival. So in that, in that, in that respect, uh, there's a need to make radical changes. But you can't just say, look, let's make radical changes. I mean, radical changes in the structure of society can come about when the large mass of the population is convinced that what exists is not going to be responsive to their just needs and demands. So therefore we'll change what exists. And activists, call them intellectuals or whatever you like, can try to help this process go forward, but they can't create it out of nothing. <coughs> So maybe we need radical ideas. Okay, let's prepare the ground for them. It's about all we can do. I think we've got uh, room, time for maybe two more questions. One over here. Hi, no, my name is Ian. I'm from the University of Winnipeg, where you've had a big influence. You know, the propaganda, political punk band, and the Mondragon movement. And um, I'm Canadian, and I haven't heard you talk about Trump. So I want to hear your thoughts on Trump. But I also, <coughs> I want to hear... <coughs> your thoughts about, you know, you've worked in universal grammar, and I, I'm curious what you think of the possibility of humanity's universal ability to cooperate, the universal ability to have compassion, and can we deal with what's going on in America and its impact on the world? Well, we better hope that we can, or else the world's in real trouble, and we have no reason to doubt that we can, so we can only try as hard as possible within the options and opportunities available to us. Uh, Trumpism is too big a topic for a couple of minutes, but there are some very striking things about what's happening in Washington. Uh, what's going on is a kind of very systematic, two-tiered uh, operation. Uh, one of them is 
Trump, uh, Bannon, uh, you know, the effort to try to make sure you capture the headlines, you're on the top of the news, uh, one crazy thing after another, uh, just to make sure that people are paying attention. And the assumption is, well, they're going to forget later anyway, so people don't talk anymore about the, the three million illegal immigrants, and pretty soon they'll stop talking about the wiretap, and you'll be on to something else. I mean, while everything is focusing on that, the Paul Ryan Republicans, who are the most, in my view, the most dangerous and savage group in the country, are busy implementing programs that they have been talking about quietly for years, very savage programs which have very simple principles. One, make sure you offer to the rich and powerful gifts beyond the, the dreams of avarice and kick everybody else in the face. And it's going on step by step right behind the bluster. And that's, and you take a look at the cabinet, the cabinet was designed that way. Every cabinet official was chosen to destroy anything of human significance in that part of the government. And it's so systematic that it can't be unplanned. I doubt that Trump planned it. My impression is that his only uh, ideology is me, you know. But whoever's working on it is doing a pretty effective job, and the Democrats are cooperating, cooperating in a very striking way. Now, take a look at the focus in Congress. It's on the few decent things that Trump has been doing. So maybe members of his uh, transition team contacted the Russians. Is that a bad thing? I mean, the uh, uh, ambas recent ambassador to Russia, Jack Matlock, really had a blog where he pointed out, it's exactly what you should be doing. That's the job of diplomats and ambassadors and people coming in. You, they're serious problems and tensions. You want to talk over if there's anything you can do about them instead of just uh, building up force and violence. So that's what the Democrats are focusing on. And meanwhile, all these other things are going on. I'm not saying anything about them. That we focus on whether, uh, in fact, they're, they're basically letting the Bannon-Trump group control uh, the, what's presented to the public. Crazy things about wiretapping, uh, did Susan Rice uh, commit a crime, or whatever tomorrow's will be. Well, meanwhile, the, uh, the, the parts of the governmental structure that are beneficial to human beings and to future generations are being systematically destroyed and with very little attention. I think my feeling is that's what it looks like. Yeah. We've got time for one more question. I'll take it from over, over here. I just wanted to update you of um, where you had spoken about a finite set of elements producing infinite combinations back in your linguistic days. I ended up identifying them, testing them, and presenting them yesterday. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, with that, oh, wait, 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 I got one more question. Noam, why did you put my picture on the front of this book? <laughs> Okay, let's go. Thank you all for coming.